If you love the drag content and all the exposed, make sure to hit that subscribe button right now and also turn your notifications on. Well, she was introduced to many of us on season seven of RuPaul's Drag Race, where she roared her way into our hearts. She came back for All Stars 3, where she once again proved that she is the dancing diva of Texas, and she is a multiple pageant title winner. Her name is Kennedy Davenport, and she's about to be exposed. Hey, Kennedy. Oh, expose me, honey. Hey. Uh <laughs> We, we're like going to expose it all. And, you know, Ooh. I do want to know, you are known as the dancing diva of Texas. When did mm -hmm. you discover your love of dance? Uh, I was in elementary school. Uh, it was probably like around the fifth or sixth grade. And I actually started moving to spoken word. That's how I, like, started to, like, feel my body and feel the elements of the air and all this kind of stuff. And I didn't know anything about dance, but that's when I started moving. Um, I realized that I, I was like, okay, this is, a, this is, a, this is something I can get into. Cause I was already singing. I was, I've been singing since I was like four. So I was, you know, it was just another talent under my belt. I want you to paint me a picture of little young Kennedy in Dallas, Texas. What were you like when you were younger? Um, I was very outgoing, uh, <laughs> very outgoing. I was a little boy with a little sugar in his tank. Um, <laughs> um, very, very talented, um, but I had a lot of, I had a lot of responsibilities. I mean. Uh, along with the talent came a lot of responsibilities at home because my sister is special needs, so I had to grow up really fast. So here I am, very talented, responsibilities at home, and then dealing with my sexuality and being different from everybody. You you said, you know, dealing with your sexuality. You know, I, I'm from Tennessee, and I know when I came out, that was the hardest thing ever, especially, you know, growing up in, you know, Baptist religion and stuff like that. That can be extremely hard. Was it hard for you in Texas to come out? Yes. Um, uh, not so much as to come out, but it was more internal because I experienced a lot of bullying during uh, uh, my younger years. So I didn't understand why people was calling me um, faggot and I didn't understand why, you know, I'm just, I'm just doing what I want to do. I just want, you know, I'm just performing. I'm just, you know, playing in sports and stuff and just living my best life and not knowing that the way I'm acting had a name to it. You know, so nobody could really explain to me why people were like so mean and stuff. And I just kind of dealt with it internally until I was about 13 years old and um, I kind of just got tired of everything and you know I that's so I experienced uh, uh, attempting suicide and that was like the start of I guess that was like the start of my depression because um, you just you just feel like you in the world by yourself you know and uh, people you have you know young kids so cruel, honey. They are cruel. So <laughs> um, it was just it. It. I don't want to say that my whole childhood was a mess, but you know, I had some very good times because you know I was. Thank God, I was very talented, and that was my kind. Of, that was like my way of escape because once I hit the stage, everything I did, everything just left. You know, it was a it was an avenue for me to just be myself and to perform. Mm -hmm. And you you briefly just touched on depression, and I know that in uh, Trixie's documentary, Moving Parts, you had mentioned that as well, about, you know, battling that. Um, has that been something that has continued with you through your whole life? Uh, just about, because I, I would say I started, it, it started like around the age of uh, 13, I want to say, 13 to, uh, I want to say my almost mid-30s. Did you, what was your way to deal with yeah. it? Yeah. Um, I did. I, I, I'm not afraid to talk to a therapist. I talked to many therapists. I was admitted uh, to the psych ward maybe one, two, th three times. Three times. And yeah. And 
Um, really, as I got older, I learned um, my triggers and I learned what really sent me into depression. And um, as I got older, part of uh, the trigger was having bad company, which was like, you know, bad relationships and people, you allow people being in your life to um, to where you allow them to question yourself. I mean, you know, you, you allow them this type of power in your life where you start to question yourself because of something that's not going right in the situation. You yeah. know, so I had to, I had to clean that up. I had to get rid of, um, you know, some things and start protect, started to protect my peace. Now I didn't like, I didn't start protecting my peace until like, I want to say a year or two ago. So, um, it was more so, um, my, um, uh, my faith strengthened and I started to realize what my worth was, you know, and I started to understand my purpose in this world. So once you, once you understand your purpose and once you understand that you are here for a reason, then the depression kind of ceases. And then when you find yourself in that place again, then you know what to do. I, I actually love that. And I'm glad that you're in a good place now. And I'm glad that you were able to like overcome that in the way that you know when things are coming, you've started to figure out your triggers. I think that's the biggest thing for anybody because you know I struggle yeah. with the same thing. And once you figure out those triggers, it's like now you can start kind of like controlling the situation. Oh, um, yes. Oh, yes. With you, your life is so complex when I was looking into it. And did I read right that you served in the Navy? Yes, I joined in 2003. Wow. Did that shape your drag mm -hmm. in any way? Um, no, because by that time I was already doing drag. I just took a break from drag because I, I mean... The, the military was for Ruben because I needed some, I needed to restructure. I needed, um, I needed to be disciplined. I needed, I just needed a, a overhaul because I mean, I was running wild. I, I mean, I experienced, I was an, I was a very young addict. Um, I experienced overdosing and, uh, through divine intervention, I was able to come out of that. And I, it, once once you come out of something like that, you just have a whole new outlook on life. And I hadn't even I hadn't even turned twenty one yet. So <laughs> yeah, so you know it was like a fresh new start, and that's when our real walking relationship with Christ began. And I just tied it all in to joining the Navy. You, you're, I mean, it's just, it's just crazy when you think about it. You literally in this first like five minutes, just your life is, is like 10 people's lives in one. If a cat has nine lives, Kennedy Davenport, you've had quite a bit of lives. Now I want to get yes. into when you fell into drag or when you started doing okay. drag, how did you come across Colexis Davenport and how did you end up, you know, cause she is your drag mother, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, OK. Well, I was kind of like playing in drag before I met Calexis. And this was during the, my rebellious time where me and my when my dad wasn't getting along and stuff. Excuse me. <clears throat> me and my dad wasn't really getting along. And so I, I would leave the house and stuff. And, you know, because I, I, my, I was always um I was always, I, I respect my dad. So I, if anything I, I wanted to do, I always just left, you know? <laughs> and um, because if anybody knows my dad, no, he did not play, okay? So um, this was during my rebellious time where I just wanted, and I, I, I'm very like open and bright and, you know, open to the scene. Like house music was like shouting music to me. Like it did something to me, you know? So um, one of my best friends was like, um, um, you know, you'll be cute in drag. You know, just a basic conversation around a blunt. And, um, you know, so I'm like, OK. And <laughs> and the rest was history. He introduced me to um, this this um, this drag queen by the name of Nikki Foster. Um, may she rest in peace. And she really taught me the basics and the ropes and stuff. And then when she, when she didn't want 
she didn't want to be my drag mother because she was attracted to me. <laughs> so she just like she just like put me in drag a few times and just called me her Barbie doll. And um, so I this is when I started getting into the gay scene. So I started meeting people, and then um, I I met this other guy who is now my drag grandmother. She was like, oh. Um, you need to meet Kalexis because you're a dancer and she's a dancer. And that's how we met. She took me over to her house and um, it was, you know, very, very brief conversation. And um, the rest was history. And because my name was not Kennedy, it was Mia. And she was like, I have to, fi- I have to find you another name because during that time, when you became a Davenport, your first name started with the K and of course, the last name was was a D, so she was like, "I have to get, I have to find you another name." So one day I called her and she was like, "Hey, Kennedy Davenport," and I was like, "Oh, that's my name. Oh, okay." And um, she gave me that name because it's a universal name. So she didn't want me to appeal to just one type of crowd or one type of people. She wanted me to be a universal, um, worldwide name. I love that she called you and just went with it and was like, Kennedy Davenport. And you're like, okay, that, that's my name. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that was a real true moment. But, I mean, my mother was very, very stern. Um, she really didn't want me to do drag because I was still in high school. And um, I was, but I was determined. I, I mean, she would, like, literally mess my face up and uh, I would go to the club <laughs> I would go to the club with a half face or blue eye shadow, uh, whatever, and, you know, because she just did not want me to do drag. But I was just determined. And, um, you know, I had people I've always had. I, I'm thankful that I always have pe- good people surround, uh, surrounding me. So I, I had a good upbringing as far as drag. I didn't have too many moments where I looked busted. But I was, you know, because I came up around the girls who were already seasoned. They were already seasoned and pageant oriented. And during that time, pageants was the way to go. So um, I, I, Texas being the mecca of drag, I was blessed to be around the girls that I already knew, you know, what to do, how to look, you know, and all of that. You, you said pageants. Now, you were known and still are known in the pageant world for you have all of these different titles. And mm. a lot of people, when they see Drag Race on TV, that may be their only knowledge of drag. So what is different mm-hmm. between the pageant world and the drag race that you may see on TV? Um, pageantry is very structured. And it also teaches you about being clean and consistent. Um, it, it teaches you to pay attention to detail from head to toe. It also teaches you how to be a, um, a people's person. It teaches you uh, customer service. It teaches you um, how to speak well because you have question and answer and you have, in some pages you have interview and in some pages you have both. You know, so it grooms you to be a well-polished queen, although it have, you know, you know, people have their different thoughts about it, but it's, it's really, uh, I would recommend any girl to just, you know, try to put their their hat in the ring uh, as far as pageants is concerned. Drag Race is more um, liberated, I would like to say, and it gives the opportunity for um, other female impersonators, drag queens, to really just be who they are, uh, really um, without being judged, in a sense. You know, we, um, Drag Race, we are critiqued and not judged, you know. Pageants, we are judged down. <laughs> <laughs> what made you want to go on Drag Race? What made me go on Drag Race? Um, I really, when I tell this story all the time, I really was not interested in Drag Race because during that time, this was because this is 
time that my, my sister Sahara was still alive and it was just before she auditioned and even after I just wasn't interested because I just didn't like the show I didn't like the direction it was going it didn't have nothing to do with a bitch out here surviving trying to survive and make it I just because I was just uninterested but I still watched every episode <laughs> <laughs> I just felt like it wasn't for me. And then um, Latrice got on. Then Coco got on. Then Alexis. And then Alyssa. And, uh, you know, Shan- I really wasn't close to Shangela. I, you know, because during, during the time I was doing drag, uh, DJ was a backup dancer. So, I, you know, I really wasn't around when DJ was, you know, uh, backup dancing for the girls and stuff. I lived in Florida. So um, these, all these girls are people that I was already close to, especially Coco and um, uh, Alexis, Mateo, and girls like that. And they started, you know, talking to me in my ear, like, girl, you need to go on an audition. And of course, Sahara, she was like, bitch, you need to go on and put a tape in, girl. So um, it was... I think my last conversation with Alexis and Alyssa that made me like go ahead and be like, okay, you know, oh, and Trinity, uh, Cable and A2. Um, so I was like, okay, girl, ugh. And it was the worst for me because I had to redo my audition tape and I had, you know, I, we, we had a deadline. So I started it in Dallas. And I was a, I was a reigning I was reigning uh, queen at the time, so I had to go to Atlanta for a pageant walk, the national walk. So I had to finish. No, well, you know they only give you like then it, the whole video had to be thirteen minutes max. My my boy interview was twenty one minutes by itself. So I had to scratch everything and redo everything once I got to Atlanta. No. Only thing I had when I went to Atlanta was my clothes, you know, the video for my clothes and stuff like that. But everything else, the interview stuff, I had to redo. So I was very discouraged. And I just said, you know what, F it. If, if, if it don't, if it don't, if it don't. If, if it don't, it just don't. You know, I was just over it. But what made me go ahead to audition really was because I knew I was already in my 30s and I had nothing to show for it. Drag, I was doing drag for so long, I really had nothing to show for it. So I was like, I need to do a career switch. I need to up, uh, not a career switch, but I just need to go into fifth gear. I need to elevate this. And I know I knew the only way to do that was to go on drag race because I needed to raise that that pay grade, honey. I needed to be charged. I needed to be charging a little bit more. So that's what really made me go in audition. So but if go back to where I was, I was really discouraged with my tape. I didn't even I didn't I didn't think it was good, but I I mean a lot of girls backed me and um they trusted me to do well on the show. So they called me on the first try. Oh, that must have been awesome. Like to think that the video was bad and then you get the call. You walked into that workroom and Jasmine Masters was the happiest thing ever to see you. She was like, Kennedy Davenport. How did that feel in that moment that people knew you? Like they're like, yes. Um, it it, it was kind of it was kind of validation because I were I'm telling you, before I got there, I was working my tail off. You know, this is when uh, YouTube had just uh, just started and stuff, and I had other people loading my videos up. I didn't even know how to do it, you know? So, I mean, I was really, really working hard and um, just putting my best foot forward and, and not even realizing that I, w- I had a, somewhat of a following. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, you got the great amazing RuPaul to end up making the little puns on your name. LaGuardia, Newark, Kennedy. Every mm-hmm. time you walked out, you became mm-hmm. this icon when you would come on stage. You obviously were showing everything off. And then there was the iconic Death Becomes Her look. And mm-hmm. you had that on. 
and that became like everywhere. And did Willem end up buying that? Yes. <laughs> because, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, because it was just sitting in my closet. I'm like, I'm never going to put this back on ever again. And so I was like, you know, this was during the pandemic and it's not like I couldn't use the money. So um, I just put it up and I put it on eBay, which is trash, by the way. Um, and somebody stood me up you know, on um, paying it, paying for it. So I just took everything down off eBay and just posted it. And um, she she said she wanted it at first. And then, and then I didn't hear back from her because I posted the, the redemption first. And then I did the original one. So when I posted the original one, she hit me up and just made an offer and I took it. I mean, it was such an iconic look. Looking at your I time- just would think Girl, wait, I didn't even think it was going to be that. You really? know, I did not. I did not think it, that people were going to like, I just thought I was going to get read for it. And that I didn't even think I was going to get read for it because I was confident in my look. I don't give a damn what anybody say. I was confident. I was confident in my look. I had my storyline, everything, because that's what they told us to do. Make, you know, it was death becomes her and we had to have a storyline on, you know, how we died. So I was confident. I didn't even think people were gonna be calling me chickens and shit. And I, you know, I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, before the pandemic hit, I was at a bar in West Hollywood, and you have like a a, a mural uh, yeah. with you in that outfit. I was like, yes. that that's crazy. Yes, I I got to meet the guy, and well, I, I met him online and everything, and thanked him and all of that. Yeah. And now it's, now it's not even a read, girl. You can't even say, girl, that's an iconic look. You can say I look yeah. the best. You, you can say it was horrible, whatever you want to say, girl. It's still iconic, girl. Go, yeah. go screw yourself. Oh, another uh -huh. iconic moment you had was your little Richard on Snatch Game. Good golly, Miss Molly. It's rock and roll legend, Lil Richard. Are you feeling a little more tooty or a little more fruity? A little more tooty, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You were, were you the first person to do a male? I, and to win, yes. Yes. Uh -huh. And that was such a big step forward too. That was something that people were frowning upon doing like a male and then you did it and you owned it. Did you, uh, oh, yeah. did you get nervous to do that? Like, did you get nervous uh, portraying a male? I wasn't nervous at all. And, I could, and, I, and I'm just saying that with the utmost confidence because I was not nervous. Um, I kind of got the validation by Rue because she was like, I'm gonna say this, it has never been done before. She said, I have yet to see someone do a male. So it wasn't the fact that there, because people have to understand there are no rules. Mm -hmm. You know, just because you see drag race going a certain way doesn't mean that there are rules set, ladies and gentlemen. There are no rules. Like, and you know, they wanted to, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it, but talking about rules. They attacked me for jumping off the stage. They attacked me. I got so much hate mail, so, so much hate mail. Oh, I broke the rules and this and that. There were no rules. There are no fucking rules. If there, if we always get briefed before we go on, before the camera rolls. And, and if, we, if I couldn't have done it, if I couldn't have done it, they would have told me. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So, you know, but yeah. I mean, that, yeah, it was that a was, great moment. That was iconic. Like, did you did you feel that in the moment too? Did you know that it was going to be so good? No, because we don't you don't hear the laughs. You don't hear the laughs. You don't even know if Root is laughing. Like, I didn't know. I wasn't even paying attention to her. You know, because we have to face, you know, we can look at her, but for the most part, if we're looking straight ahead, so I didn't even know. I didn't even know that Tamar was laughing, you know? And I was just spitting that stuff out. And it's very, it's 
it's real improvisation, okay? And you have to know how to make you have to know how to make people laugh, and you just have to trust that you're being funny. Mm hmm. Because I didn't even I when when it when it finally aired, I laughed myself. I was like, I didn't even know I had said that stupid shit. <laughs> oh my goodness. I didn't even know I had said all of this stuff. I was like, oh, my God. It, it was just crazy. It was a great moment. And it was great to feed off of Ginger. We were feeding off of each other. And we had great energy. So it was really, it, it just flowed naturally. Yeah, and, and that's clearly what everybody saw. Because you showed off your improv chops there. And then we'll get into it in a little bit. But then you showed off your improv chops again in All Stars. Like, you have this amazing gift that you know you can pull things off of a whim and make a situation really really good um your outfits and everything were always phenomenal your stage presence was also great you had one of the most memorable lip syncs to roar by Katy perry mm -hmm. did you know in that moment of doing that uh lip sync that it would become such a big thing um, not really, but the, not, but how can I say it? That moment was, I mean, that moment was everything. Like in the studio, like it was like, it was a performance. It was a real performance. So I knew, I didn't know what type of impact it would have once, you know, the the viewers saw it, but it was a, an an amazing experience at that moment. Like the producers, I mean, the reactions were real. You make it to the top four of season seven. You were mm -hmm. one inkling away from that top three. Do mm -hmm. you think that you should have been in the top three? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And I only say that because when you are on the show and you trust what the you trust what's going on at the time you feel like the process the whole process of 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 what's going on is supposed to earn your way to that spot but that's not the case you know, I, I I believe it's more than just your performance, you know, and let's be clear, I'm not bitter. That shit happened a long time ago, mm -hmm. okay? So put that disclaimer out there, I'm not bitter. But it's like, I understand TV. I understand how it goes now. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, I, do I feel like I should have been in the top three. Yes, I do, given the last performance, because I ate all of them up, mm -hmm. including the video. I ate all of them up. <laughs> so, you know, I felt like my performances, you know, my performance should, uh, that last challenge should have earned my spot there. But I do understand that out of all four, out of all of us, I was the least with the most followings. And, you know, they had uh, they had more followers than I did, and they were liked more, you know. So you have to, and, and me, I'm. This is just my own philosophy, mm -hmm. you know. Business wise, you have to think what's going to be good for the brand. So if you, they feel like this, you know, crowning these young queens, um, uh, not crowning, not crowning, but advancing mm -hmm. um, the younger queens is going to bring m more attention and more ratings than crowning someone that the audience don't didn't really too much care for if i'm making sense yeah no no no. you're making sense it's kind of like a uh um what's going to bring in the ratings the drama and stuff like that do i have something on my face those type things is what yeah totally makes yeah. sense yeah well you you put it back on again in all stars three you come mm -hmm. back what made you want to come back to the show because I felt like, and this is this comes from my heart. I really felt like I, um, it, although everything was true, and you know, 
the edit, even with the edit and all that, I just felt like America didn't really get to see who Kennedy Davenport really was, or or Ruben for that matter. And I just I just felt like I needed to show them a different side of me and to let them know I'm not this bitter bitch. I don't always have an attitude. I'm just a Texan. I talk with a heavy accent and my humor is dry. So once you get to know me, you'll know that it's not even that. I've never, I had never ever had any problems with any type of local fans or drag queens or anything before Drag Race. You know, and it shocked me. It threw me back to know that people saw me differently than what I worked so hard to become. So it was like I was more than willing, more than ready to get on there and to just relax and play the game well, but also, you know, have fun and to give them a different side of me. Mm hmm. You said that people saw you in a way that you don't see yourself. How did people see you? Um, at, at that time, mm -hmm. yeah, they. It, I mean, they just thought I was bitter. They thought I was uh, mean. They thought I was attacking the younger queens. And that was not the case, even though, you know, I was I was frustrated because people you have to understand I don't know these people these people don't know me so we got to try to get to know each other and compete all at the same time so it, it frustrating and it was it was type it, it was it was rather frustrating because you have some some of the girls and it's not even about the young girls it's just everybody in general you have some of the girls just full of themselves and every conversation is about them. You know what I'm saying? I'm not used to that. You know, and if any any type of people with that type of energy, I just don't be around. You know? So being forced to be around it and being forced to listen to them all day, every day, it was like, oh, girl, shut up, please. You know, and it wasn't about being mean or bitter, but it was like, oh my God, is this something else? Like, it, it, it shows, like, on one of the episodes, I was like, oh, these girls, they just talk so much that they ain't never been through nothing. It was the truth. It, that it may, I may have, like, came off saying it like I was just dry and, like, over it, but it was the truth. Like, you have this 22-year-old that's doing drag and ain't never, you know, ain't my, walked in my shoes, basically, and haven't experienced life yet, and you have so much to say, you know? But being on being on season seven helped me to appreciate girls like that. It helped me to appreciate different styles of drag. It helped, you know, it just helped me to see drag in a different light. So that's why I was so eager to come back to All Stars because I can appreciate somebody else's interpretation of drag. And even if they talk their head off, I can still sit there and listen and still respect it. Yeah, and you you came back and you showed everybody what you had. You end up, you were, I mean, you were hilarious in The Bitchler. Do you anticipate acting or any type of improv in your future? Uh, in the future, yes, of course. I, I mean, I, I was in AJ and the Queen, and it was a great experience. And I was like, I think I really, because season seven, the acting was like trash, and I just couldn't get with the hang of it. And I, I can't, I couldn't get the hang of it, you know. And that's why that Merle Ginsburg challenge. I was so glad I was safe, Jesus, because I just struggled, but. Man, it was an easy breezy. It was easy breezy um, for for All Stars, and I didn't have any bad critiques. And even when um, Michelle said she wished I would have given more, Ross came back right around and said because he was the director, it was really nothing she could. It was really nothing more she could do with that part. Because I went over and beyond, and it, it, it everything for All Stars flowed like honey. After at least after the Janet, I was easy. I was it was easy. It was easy breezy, and I I mean that's why I get chills even talking about it to this day. It was like the best experience. Even when I feel like I was going home, God said no. 
because I just felt like I you feel like it's time for you to go home and you know the producers ready for you to go. <laughs> ah! And not that not that I was a bad person or anything, you know, it's just you know, you get in the you get in the groove of things and you already know, well, your girl, I'll see y'all later, girl. You know, it's just it's very that. But then when being shocked everybody and sit yourself home, I couldn't do nothing but cry because I just knew that was my time to go. Because out of who was in the bottom, I had been in the bottom the most, you know. And people don't understand that it, it wasn't about my performance. It was about their preferences. It's about what the judges were liking at the time. You know, I don't say I don't think I had presented myself any. Um, I don't think I presented myself bad at all because my my critiques from them were very, um, very minimal and except for the Janet. But everything else was very minimal and it's it's all a matter at the end of the day it's just like a pageant it's always at the end of the day it's their opinion it's on who they feel should be America's Next Drag Superstar no matter how hard you try if you don't fit in that mode you just don't fit in that mode and I understand that you you said you said Ben's Ben's moment I yeah. want you to paint me the picture of what was going through your mind. Did you expect that at all? No, nobody did. So you nobody were shocked? Did. Yeah, everybody was, even Rue. And I think Rue was slightly pissed. Mm -hmm. Because one thing, I, one thing being around her and even, even with the cameras on, she, doesn't, she don't like somebody to quit. She don't like people who who are too modest when it comes to competition. She like a bitch that don't mind throwing a hoe under the bus to win. That's and that's how she is. And you you can roll the tape back, you know, and and um quote me because that's you know when she when she brings us on, she want us to be fierce competitors. She want us to you know, um do whatever we have to do to win. Mm -hmm. But I'm, in so many ways, I'm not that girl. I don't sacrifice my integrity. I don't uh, shoot another girl down just to come up. That's that's not my line of work. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not, that's not my calling, boo. I don't do that. So when I sense the other girls doing it to me or doing it in the show, then I call it out and I completely shut down on them. You said you don't shoot another girl, but on All Stars 3, you said that your ex had stole your stuff and you shot him. Is that true? Ah, no, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was straight improv. <laughs> Man, you, you literally had so many memeable moments, or memes, as you said. Okay. But they're, okay. I was talking to Aja recently, and she said that when you were on All Stars 3 and you had that lipstick of milk, she said you could not have flipped that thing faster. She said she laughed every single time because they made all the memes where Rue would be like, and Kennedy, who do you, milk. Kennedy, with great power, milk. Yeah, that, that's not how that goes. And that's not how that went. They just cut my talking out. And that is so tired because um, although I knew who I wanted to go home, I did have something to say. And I did not cut her off. And, and, and as a matter of fact, they tell us not to go do it so fast. They tell us to say something you know what I'm saying? You have to, you, it's the drama of it all. So I did not do it that fast, child. You, you also mentioned during, or like in, during All Stars 3, you said you had like a little moment where you had talked about that you don't like feeling like, you know, the last minute of somebody, if they're at a meet and greet or at drag con or something mm -hmm. and people, you mm -hmm. know, you, you're kind of like an afterthought. Mm -hmm. What has this fan base been like towards you uh, since all stars it was like a, a complete turnaround um and i oh i still get emotional um 
they have been so great to me. They have been so wonderful, um, even with everything that's going on right now. Um, it, I mean, it was. It just validates me, me being the person that I am. They saw, finally saw, the Kennedy down that I wanted them to see, and um, the fan base is so great. And I didn't, you know, you still get the little airheads and stuff that that are just plain ignorant. But I don't pay any attention to them, um, you know, or they just have no access to me. Um, but. The fan base that truly love me, they they tell me they love me every day. And my true fan base has not given up. They still hit me up, although I'm not on TV. Um, they still make me feel relevant. Um, they love my family just as much as they love me. And you can't ask for anything else. I love that. I love that it turned around because after season seven, that must have been hard. And then to come yeah, on. Yeah, it was very free. hard. It was a very hard journey. Yeah, it was a very hard journey. I mean, I got called the N word. I got I got um, people wishing that I was dead. You know, just young, stupid stuff. I got all of that too. You know, and I don't. You know, I knew that I had my work cut out for me. I knew I was gonna have to damn near break my neck to just prove to people that. I wasn't what they saw on television. And that's what I did. If it, if it meant answering every message, if it meant, you know, ha indulging in a conversation with somebody who has talked down on me, I did it. You know, some people like ignore the haters, ignore. I ignore some, but I also hit some people up and changed their mind about me. Because a lot of times they just looking for attention or a lot of times they may be struggling in their own life. So I, t I, I did find myself asking a few of them, like, why do you feel this way? You know, why, why, why such the, the hostility and why you have to talk to me like that and you don't even know who I am, you know? And a lot of that, uh, a lot of that interaction helped. Mm -hmm. Did so? Did they respond after you said that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I also think that that's pretty amazing. That you had the balls to end up sending a message back. Like I, I feel like I would be like, I don't know why, but I feel like I'd be scared. I'd be like, no. Uh, no, no nobody, don't nobody scare, nobody scare me, but God. Mm. <laughs> nobody put no fear. <laughs> Nobody put no fear in my heart, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, this is a business. And social media for any queen should be, if you're not on stage, social media should be at least 80% of your time. And that's how I feel. So I'm always checking my messages. I'm always mm -hmm. indulging with my with with my fans and stuff and talking to them. And if it's just a simple heart, or a simple like to just let them know I see them. That's that's the most important to me because I feel like it's 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 the quality versus the quantity. That's so true. That that's literally so true. It's the, those interactions and then just the fact that you are responding and doing that just says a whole lot about you. But that's engaging your fans at the end of the day. Like coming yeah. on the internet and engaging with them is gonna be why they keep coming to your shows and why they keep, you know, supporting you at the end of the day, because they love that. They love the interaction. Correct. Correct. And that's all that that's all they want. And that was really my whole point um, when they chopped up my speech <laughs> on season seven. Um, I knew at that particular time that my counterparts, mainly Violet and Pearl, that they just wasn't ready for what the fan base was wanting to give to them. You know what I'm saying? They clearly, you know, they just wasn't people, in my opinion, at that time, I let me be specific, at that time, they just were not people, persons. They were not, they, they were, you know what I'm saying? So that was, that's all I was trying to say. But, you know, I, I grew 
to love Violet and I grew to love Pearl and I love all of my sisters on RuPaul's Drag Race um, season seven and I miss them terribly. But, you know, it at the end of the day, it's all about who they chose be in that top three it had nothing to do with them it had nothing to do with them it was a decision that that you know that it's just like a pageant if i win the pageant i didn't judge myself so you can't be mad at me <laughs> i didn't judge myself you know so it's very that so i you know i was never bitter i was never ever bitter at none of them you know what i'm saying because i understand the business i understand how it goes you know mm -hmm. so you you mentioned being judged and for all stars three you're judged by your peers and mm -hmm. they put you in the top two mm -hmm. your the look on your face was of shock were you shocked uh, I was shocked, and I was also shocked that I had the most votes. I had the most votes. Like I, it was like, it was like, I was in that thing hands down. It was unanimous. Like I would have won the show had we not had to lip sync. Had they voted for for a winner, I would have won because I even had more votes to Trixie. Like I'm t probably like three or four more votes than, you know, her. But um, it was shocking, but I was also confident that when, when it, the announcement came that they were going to be uh, voting who made the top two, I was confident because I knew what I had poured into that workroom. I knew the conversations that I had with each and every one of them, you know? So it wasn't like, oh, Lord, I'm going to go home. I didn't feel that. I felt confident. I felt like, you know what? It is what it is. I've done my best, and there's nothing more that I can do. And I, and, and I was grateful that my sister saw the same thing. Mm. You have to perform Wrecking Ball as mm -hmm. your final two song. Mm -hmm. I will say I rewatched it the other night and I believe once again, as I believed back then, that you were the winner of that. Did you feel that way watching it back? I do feel like I was the winner. Um, <clears throat> because one thing that production do is give us instruction. And they tell us how they want the lip sync delivered. And and they just did not want us standing there and lip syncing. They specifically said that. That's why you see Shangela standing in the back with all that bullshit she had on. <laughs> Was it balloons? Under balloons, it? streamers, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Because we had you, you can ask, you can ask her, you can ask um, uh, BB. We like was scrambling trying to create this slow ass song and trying to make it something, you know, to to make it out of something. So I felt like I followed the instructions because I had I had yet that that was one talent that they hadn't seen me do yet. They hadn't seen me interpretive, modern, contemporary. They hadn't seen me do that yet. And I just, and then I hate the edit because they make it seem like I was just dancing all over the place and I was not. I actually stood there before I even started dancing because we have to do the whole song. So I dragged the whole, I dragged all the verses and I only danced during the choruses and the vamp. Wow. I mean, you know, the climax. Mm -hmm. So, but they cut it up to make it seem like I was all over the place. Like it, it, the, it, it was so tense in the room. Rue was like, um, I think we need to take a break. She was like, I think we need to take a break and just like Wusa, <laughs> cause wow. it was that, it was that tense with emotion. Um, I feel like I emoted the song. Um, I feel like my delivery um, was was there and a little bit better, 
Um, but I mean, I, I can't take anything away from Trixie because she did the best that she uh, knew how. Mm -hmm. You know, so like I said, it don't have anything to do with us. We did we did our job. It's the person who decides who wins. Yeah. But do I feel like I won their lip sync? Yes, of course. One of the questions that I got from people is they want to know why you may be bitter towards Trixie. Okay, let's get this story straight. And I need everybody to know what's going on. I was never bitter with Trixie. First, how can I say it? My, my, and I, I, I mean, my feelings were hurt. My feelings were hurt. And my feelings, that, that feeling of hurt came, uh, was followed by being mad. Because before I actually got to watch, we, you know, before you get to actually watch the season, you know, even on before we left the set, you know, me and Trixie became very close. At least I thought. <laughs> we became very close. And we even kept we even kept up with each other um, after, you know, she would call me. I would call her. We were Kiki and girlfriend and da da da. But not one time did she even give me a warning that she was going to be laying me every e episode. Mm. Every every episode you have something negative to say about me. And and this is like I made a I made a, a quote, I made I made a post a while a while ago. Um and it was like you don't like us drag some drag drag race girls don't understand the power that they have when it comes to these fans. So you can say one thing and the the fans is gonna take it and they're gonna abuse us with it. If you're talking about us, then they're gonna take what you are saying about us and drag us. So every episode, she was just she just had something to say, something negative to say. Even at the final, when we had to sit and talk to everybody, you had touched, you had something bad to say about me then. Like that really hurt my feelings because a real friend would say, "Bitch, get ready," because I did read you. You know, girl, I'm just letting you know. I said, you know, they asked me, and I had to tell them, girl, how I felt. I didn't get none of that from Trixie. And um, after that last episode, I had just had it. And so when they announced her as the winner, I texted her. I congratulated her. Yeah, I was going to say, do I have it in my phone? This is not the phone. <laughs> but I text her. I text her. You, I have. I keep receipts. Um, I text her. I congratulated her. And that same, I didn't think that same weekend or something, we were all booked together. And I just simply told her, the best thing for you to do is just stay away from me. And I said, you know, I'd rather not even talk to you. Um, I really just rather for us to keep our distance. Because at that point, I saw her as a fake ass bitch. And I saw her as fake. And I saw her as somebody who was willing to sacrifice their integrity, integrity and character to win. And to give the, the, the producers what they want. And she was, you know, she wanted to blame it on the producers and this and that. I said, well, we all had a choice. We all, we all had a choice. I chose not to read y'all. Because y'all were my sisters. You know, I chose not to see the confessional and, 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 and down talk people. And I told production that, no, I'm not going to do that. But if you tell me what you're looking for, I'll give you, you know, let me mm -hmm. do it my own, let me do it my own way. So, you know, she, you know, she took it away. She took it out of context. And, um, but at that time, I was just really hurt because I really thought I had a friend. I, I was really happy that we didn't get to, we didn't get to bond like we bonded in, in, in season seven. We didn't get to bond like we bonded in All Stars, you know, and we really bonded. And, you know, and when somebody take out the time to call you 
and they say, hey, girl, what you doing? And FaceTime you. And, you know, that stuff means a lot to me. You know, that means a whole lot to me because you present to me how you are. I believe you until you show otherwise. And she showed otherwise. So the best thing, because if it, if somebody show you who they are and they change up on you, the best thing for you, for, for, uh, in my in my position, the best thing for you to do is to stay far away from me as you can because it'll bring out a character in me that is not me. I'd rather keep that person balled up and on the inside. So it was not the fact that she won, that I was bitter. I've never been a sore loser. I've been competing since the age of eight. Okay? My dad had always taught me, and let's be clear, my dad always taught me that there's always going to be somebody better than you. And you're not going to always win. So I always had that in my mind that, you know, there's, you, you know I, I'm, I'm, I do the best that I can do. And at the end of the day, if I'm chosen, I'm chosen. I've competed in over 50 pageants. And I've, I've lost at least about 20 of them. I won about 30. But, you know, I learned to, you have to learn to lose before you win. So there was no bitterness in my heart. I don't carry bitterness around me. I don't, excuse me, I don't even allow it in my space. I don't allow it in my circle because that's not who I am. I don't allow that type of energy to even come in my way. So I'm happy that she won. If she's the winner, I'm happy that she won. It was more personal for me. And, you know, that's why I was like, like, when this year came, 2021, and dealing with COVID and stuff like that, I had to learn how to forgive. And she's probably the only person in this entire world that I was not doing. She is. She is the only person that I had dealings with and that had that type of close encounter with that I just don't fuck with. And for a while, that's what I was saying. I don't fuck with her. I don't fuck with her. And I don't, you know, I don't care for her because clearly you did not care for me enough to think twice before you answered that question. And because you because you gave them what they were asking for, they just kept asking because they knew you was going to say something, you know. And then I, you know, I try to give her the benefit of that because that's just her humor. She talk about everybody, you know, so I give the benefit of the doubt. But to not even get so much of a warning, it was like a slap in my face. So that was the only reason why I just chose not to, you know, I, can I work with her? Sure can. Can we uh, have a conversation? Sure can. But I just keep my distance. It's not the fact that I didn't want her in my space. Oh, I can't work with her. Maybe I'd have worked with a lot of people I don't like. I'm a professional. And ain't nobody finna mess up my money. Nobody's finna mess up my money. I don't care. We can, I can work with you and not like you. I can have a conversation with you and not like you. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about you behind your back and things like that. Anything I have to say to you, I say to your face. Uh, or if I don't want to say anything at all, I just don't say anything at all. And that's what I chose to do with our situation was you just stay over there and I'm going to stay over here. So there was no bitterness at all towards that lady. I'm glad I am happy for her success and everything that she has accomplished. I feel like she's very, very talented. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's it. That's it on that. And do I forgive her now? Yes. And if she call me tomorrow, then bitch, yeah, what's the tea? How you doing? You know what I'm saying? Because that shit was three years ago. That shit was three, four years ago. I'm over that. I'm 40 years old. I don't have time to, you know, holding on to things like that. I just know how people are when they present themselves to you now. When they present themselves to you. You just keep what they give you. Yeah. I want to ask you about a friend that was near and dear to you. 
And if it gets emotional, I apologize. But I want to talk about Chi-Chi. I already Chi-Chi. had me tearing up and stuff. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I want to talk about Chi-Chi. I want to talk about your mm-hmm. friendship with her. The, the bond that you guys had on All Stars was great. You guys had a very, very great relationship. What did Chi-Chi mean to you? Um, she was so young and fresh. She just was like, Chi Chi got to do everything on her season that I was supposed to have been doing on my season. Like she went everywhere, the places that I wanted to go. <laughs> she got to do everything. She was just, she was a sense of home, um, very genuine. Um, she was just a pure hearted person and she gave her last, even to her family and everything. She tried to help everybody out as much as she could. And she was just, she was just my little world. Like we had so much fun together and it was like her escape too, you know, and I stayed on her, you know, I, I, I mean, I became, you know, out of respect for her, her, drag mother it was just never official but she was my drag daughter and um me and her first her second drag mother really didn't come to terms until after she passed and to just understand that you know we shared a gem we really really did so she was just she was a sweetheart and and it was it, it was it, it was just the saying what's not to love there was not a, like a bad bone in her body it was i mean that was my sweetheart she is truly messed and i think that that was like so unexpected i mean for everybody that that you know that she passed but um i mean her legacy lives on she was incredible on the show and you know you having that close bond is like a thing that happens once in a lifetime with somebody. So that in itself is incredible. Oh yes. Yes. For sure. So moving on after all stars, you end up back on our screens again for all stars five and you are a lip sync assassin and the fans need to know. Was this the song that was originally planned? Yes. Yes, it was. And um, it's almost like they were, they ran out of uh, uh, music that they had that that they uh, had licensed to, and they didn't have much time. And this was another opportunity for me to be on television, so I took the challenge. And I felt like I could do it, and I knew it was a lot on my plate, but I just, it was terrible. I did not know, I didn't know it. I didn't know the song. And that's the only reason that saved Miss Cracker's ass. Wow. Okay. Did you, when were you given the song? I, I, I think I was, no, I, don't, I don't think. I think I had, no, I, I keep saying I think, I had two days. I had, yeah, I had an evening, because they call me the evening. Then I had all day, and then I had the top part of the next evening while I was in L.A., so basically two days. Oh. And that's just too much to learn. So, I mean, the edit was great. Like, I ooh, I would never, ever say anything bad about editing ever again because they made me look flawless, okay? But I didn't know it, and, girl, Miss Cracker didn't really know it either. So, you know, but that was the only thing, that's the only thing that kept me from showing out. What, you know, America needs to know that you know, I am a lipstick assassin and you can put anything in front of me and I can turn it into gold. It was mm-hmm. just the fact that I just didn't know the song. I didn't know the song. So that's why I couldn't really get into it. I was just, I hate getting on stage and not knowing my words. Yeah. 
Well, I am about to share my screen with you. I am going to show you a picture of you from a long okay. time ago, early drag oh. days. And I want you to tell me where you were in this moment, okay? Oh, Lord, okay. You, <laughs> you're scared. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, oh my goodness. Where okay, were you? Can I, um, I was at the club where I got my start. This was like probably at the point of my career, uh, my little baby career. Um, I was I was just about to do um, I was I, that night I did Let's Get Loud and um, this was the first time that I this was this was the first time outside of my drag mother someone else did my makeup and this is how I took this very picture and took a close closer shot before I put my hair on and everything and I placed this that head shot um on the bathroom window, uh, not window, mirror at, at college. And that's how I learned how to do my makeup was uh, looking at this picture. But this night, um, yeah, I was getting ready to do um, Let's Get Loud. And yeah, this was at the Metro, downtown Dallas. It later on became Elm and Pearl. It doesn't exist anymore. But yeah, that's what, and you can mm -hmm. see I was skinty. That is so funny. Like I saw that and I was like, oh my gosh, it has. You could tell me I wasn't paying it though. No, yeah. yeah. And I, I love too that you said that you took a picture of that and then used that to do your makeup. That is actually pretty clever. Yeah, because we didn't have YouTube and stuff back then. Mm -hmm. We had to learn on our own. You know, we had to make those mistakes and all of that stuff. We, it was trial and error, baby. Or whenever you got to the club, you just hope one of the girls were in the dressing room doing their face and you just sit next to them. And that's how you learn. What do you think the biggest misconception of Kennedy Davenport is? Um, at this moment, I don't think I, uh, I, I don't think that there is a misconception because I've tried to live my life uh, in full transparency. Um, I am an open book. And probably with somebody that don't know me, they may still think that I'm a bitch or I may be rude at times or whatever. But normally it's somebody that's drunk that wants attention. And one thing that I do not tolerate is drunk people. And I drink myself, but you know, it's supposed to, you're supposed to be respectful. Mm -hmm. And in order to get uh, in order to get the right response from somebody that you really really like, you have to be respectful. You know, so um, I I encourage people to get to know me, and that's why I do take out the time to answer every message and stop. And I do talk to people um, on, on bookings and stuff, even if it's not a meet and greet. You know. Mm -hmm. um, so in my mind, I don't think I, you know, that there is, you know, a misconception of me. If there was, I wouldn't know. Mm. That's a good answer. And I'm glad that you, you know, have been able to, to do that, to be able to like, be like, you know, I presented myself the way that I am and people can take it, they can leave it. And I'm happy with how I am. That, that's a really good feeling to have. Um, yeah, looking... and I'm always up for I'm always up for a conversation. Yeah, I'm always up for a conversation. If you don't understand something that's going on with me, just ask me. Love that. What's What's next for Kennedy Davenport? What do you have down the pipeline? What's 2021? What do you hope it brings? What are you bringing? I mean, I would love to give. I I would love to do some more acting and stuff. So I guess I would have to look into like getting an acting agent. Um, but right now, I, and I'm just being honest. I'm just in survival mode. So I'm, you know, I, I'm I'm not the that, that girl that's taking those thousand dollar book, bookings right now. Although they would be great, but we are in a pandemic, and so right now I'm just in survival mode. I'm working sometimes two two nights a week. Uh, I mean, uh, two, two, two shows a night, um, 
like last week, I did two shows Friday, two shows Saturday, two shows Sunday. And I'm not the only girl that's doing that. You know what I'm saying? You We have a brunch and later on, you got the night show. So, I mean, I've never stopped being a local girl. And um, I've never, you know, turned down any money. <laughs> so I've been doing a lot of negotiating with bars and things like that to just try to keep working. And... Um, mainly recreating new avenues within my own city here in Dallas to try to stay at home as much as I can, being that my sister is still in the hospital and, and recovering right now. So, I mean, I'm still, I just started back traveling uh, uh, here and there. But for the most part, just, I mean, all I ever wanted to do for them, like all the extra stuff that come with it, like TV and um, merch and, doing all that kind of stuff and having your own website and all that kind of stuff. I mean, all of that stuff is incentive and it's, you know, extra stuff. But I'm old school. Call me and book me. (laughs) (laughs) You put that so eloquently. Just call me and book me. Let's go old school. Okay, shoot. My if you, if you got my email and it, whatever, just DM me, honey. I need <laughs> you know. I there's still there's still places I have yet to high kick in. Okay. Yes. My my last question for you is: What is a message or words of wisdom that you have for our beautiful LGBTQIA plus community? Oh, it's a, I mean it's a lot <laughs> because I've been through so much. Um, Um, first I have to tell them don't allow situations uh, that's going on around you and in your life uh, to change who you are as a person once you realize who you are as a person don't let so be careful because you cannot expect people to accept you for who you are you know you can't even your parents even your family they don't have to accept you they don't have to ex- they don't have to they don't have to accept you that's your lifestyle mm-hmm. but what you can do is respect yourself respect the lifestyle so that you can have their respect in return um um entertainers remain humble and know that without an audience we can't do what we love to do but for my you know for my younger generation in this and within our community i mean just stay encouraged stay motivated and don't let anything get in the way of um what you want to accomplish in life um there's always a brighter side don't give up on yourself don't give up on whatever you want to accomplish in this world. And, and even if you are dealing with depression, don't allow it to defeat you. There's always an escape. There's mm-hmm. always an escape. There is always an escape. And that's not suicide. So keep loving yourself. Find Surround yourself with people that love you wholeheartedly. But don't force yourself on anybody. Ugh, you just spoke to my heart. That was beautiful. Um, Kennedy, I cannot thank you enough for being here with me today. Thank you for having me. exposing yourself. Yes, um, it's supposed to be honey. Yes. Where can everybody <laughs> find you on the socials? Um, Twitter and Instagram is the same handle. Kennedy, double D-O-F-T-X. That's Kennedy, Dancing Diva of Texas. And of course, I'm always on Facebook. It's Kennedy Davenport. My fam, my fan page is Miss Kennedy Davenport, but I'm mostly on Kennedy Davenport. So you can just hit me up, follow me if you're not following me, and I'll chat with you. I always check my messages and stuff, and I always post where I'm going to be. So, you you know, I don't have a website, um, but I'm always posting where I'm going to be. So I hope to see everybody that's watching in some city or state near. Yes. And then you always, I know I love following you on Twitter when you do your little, when you're watching Drag Race, your little live tweeting ah! about that. That's always the best. Yes, girl. But this was so boring, girl. They didn't have to make up each other. I fell asleep on that shit. <laughs> 
so damn boring. Are we on I like episode like, 500 now this season? Okay. Well, I, well, we had a lot of seasons. I mean, we had a lot of episodes too. Oh yeah, for some, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, like, and then on Fridays, I have a, I have a happy hour show, so I don't get to watch it when everybody gets to watch mm-hmm. it, so that's why I come in late, I'm like, okay, I'm watching it now, let's see, <laughs> and it was nothing to really talk about, I fell asleep, I literally fell asleep on the show, so I just know who went home, which I knew that was going to happen eventually, because the knowledge just stayed too much in her head, so I knew she was going to be going home soon, but, um, yeah, yeah y'all, <laughs> y'all catch me on Twitter, honey. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much again, Kennedy. Be sure to uh, like, subscribe, write your favorite comments down below. And until next time, I'm Joseph Shepard, and that's the beautiful... Oh my gosh, what happened there? <laughs> ah! <laughs> well, I'm Joseph Shepard, and that's the beautiful Kennedy... Da- Why can I not speak? That's the beautiful Kennedy me. Davenport. You mesmerized by me. You can't take uh, me. I just mesmerized. Thank you so yeah! much, Kennedy. This was great. I absolutely love this. You, uh, oh, thank you. You've been my favorite for quite some time, so this was an honor. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. And I love everybody out there. And remember, if you want to quote me, make sure you watch the whole interview, bitch. <laughs>